In this episode of the Expert Interview Series, I talk to microbiome specialist Viola Sampson about the role of the gut in long COVID. Often called the small brain, the impact that the gut can have on our physiological function and health is frequently underestimated. And with the majority of long haulers having experienced GI disturbance in their acute phase of illness, as well as the gut being implicated as a potential site for viral persistence, it's definitely somewhere we should be pointing the microscope. In this film, we talk about what the ideal diet should be, how to manage a low histamine version of it, and what role pre and probiotics should play with recovering long haulers. Hope you find it useful. So um, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So um, my original training was a BSc in medical biosciences. Um, and actually, unusually for that course, I ended up doing modules right into through my second year into ecology, which I now realize um, really set me up for that kind of systemic thinking that I use a lot in my microbiome analysis practice now. Um, so I began my career in lab-based medical research. Um, but I think the other thing that I really want to mention is that alongside of all of this, I, um, when I was 19, I fell ill with ME, chronic fatigue. So probably Epstein-Barr, maybe other triggers, um, but we're talking, you know, this was a long time ago. Um, at best, it was called yuppie flu in those days. And, you know, I was really subjected to a lot of medical gaslighting in that time. Um, and it took me about 10 years to get a diagnosis at all. Um, you know, and all of that time, I was like pushing through, pushing through. Um, and in that time, so I sort of, I was really up quite unwell for about 15 years. Um, so that was all of my 20s and quite a big chunk of my 30s. So um, but I found something called craniosacral therapy, which um, was really central to my recovery. I mean, I tried all kinds of odd things. So something called craniosacral therapy just didn't seem bizarre by that stage. Um, and so I thought it was so amazing that I trained in it. Um, and yeah, so that was um, almost 17 years ago now. Um, so I was in my mid thirties, but I still had gut issues. So I had gut issues from a child that preceded the, the ME and chronic fatigue. And in my thirties, I was still on a very restricted diet. So gluten-free, dairy-free, nightshade-free, a gazillion other kind of random triggers that we now really kind of know are histamine related. Um, I think you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I got really fascinated in gut health and kind of went back to my kind of early interests in um, bacteria, because I used to work with bacteria in the lab. Um, and dived into the medical literature about the microbiome. And it was really early days back, back then, the microbiome, the human microbiome project was only just getting going. Um, and I started experimenting with my own microbiome with, um, using some of the first tests that were available um, with this sort of overarching goal, really, of being able to eat pizza. That was my health <laughs> goal. <laughs> it was like gluten, nightshade, dairy, all in one thing. Well, yum. Um, and I've made it, you know, I do, I do regularly eat pizza now. <laughs> so, um, and I, you know, did some courses with then the kind of the experts that were kind of emerging from the US and Australia, began treating family and friends, and then eventually set up in practice. And then um, just over a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, I got invited to join a, a really fantastic team of a very progressive um, psychiatrists and psychotherapists and, uh, who are setting up a, a group clinic in, on Harley Street. Um, so I started working with them and um, doing the kind of microbiome analysis. Um, so that's a really kind of rapid fire. <laughs> yes, you've done um, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think when yeah. you've lost nearly 15 years of your life to an illness, like when you get better, you really want to pack it all in, basically. That's yeah. That's what I do now. And, and you really do go down a rabbit hole with chronic illness, don't you? Like yeah. in terms of like trying everything, investigating everything, delving into every last recess of trying to understand what the hell is going on. Um, yeah. Just, I mean, I mean, this isn't what we're supposed to be talking about, but can you tell us a little bit about what craniosacral therapy is and how you think it helps you recover from ME? Yeah, well, I think the kind of at its sort of most simple, perhaps, and, and at its most profound, it's um, vagus nerve stimulation. Hmm. 
So, I mean, what it looks like is, um, well, it's a bit like watching, watching paint dry, probably, you, you, is a practitioner generally holding someone's head lying on a table. And it's just a, a very light touch. And what we're doing is listening with the hands. Now, when I got into this, obviously, with my kind of med medical biosciences training, I wanted to know the how does it work and and I think that there are lots of theories and models, um, you know, some quite spiritual, some quite physiological as to how it works. But I think ultimately we don't we don't really know how it works, apart from perhaps the kind of it seems to be that the kind of relational listening touch is deeply, deeply relaxing for the body. So it's like you go into a very deep meditative state. Um, and there's more that we're doing. We're kind of reflecting back. It's like a body language. So. I'm feeling the smallest, smallest movements within the body and fluid flows and reflecting that back to the body. Um, so yeah, it's very, very gentle and very profound. And I think when it's, where it's relevant to fatigue conditions in particular is that autonomic nervous system dysregulation. Um, I know you've covered a lot in your, um, in your videos. Yeah. So um, it's accessing that rest digest um, where healing occurs and of course we know the vagus nerve has a lot to do with inflammation so I think those are the kind of in a way the kind of the the sort of twin aspects that keeps a fatigue condition so stuck it's that nervous system that dysregulated stress response on a physiological level we're so used to thinking of stress as something mental this is like on a physiological level and you've got the inflammation and how those two then react interact um and keep that fatigue such a stuck picture um yeah, so yeah. That, it makes perfect sense to me in you know everywhere that i've got to in the last <laughs> 18 months or so um so um could you tell us a little bit about what you've experienced in your practice and what you've seen in terms of and what the literature may say about the relationship between gut health and chronic fatigue related conditions um, obviously gut health and digestive symptoms, I mean, gosh, IBS type symptoms, SIBO, so small intestinal bacterial growth, overgrowth, histamine issues, that's like massive within the chronic fatigue community, isn't it? Um, but the, the P, if there's one thing that I want people to take away from today, I think it's the role of the microbiome, the gut microbiome in inflammation reducing inflammation and promoting inflammation in the body what can we do <laughs> what should and what shouldn't we do to elicit the right reactions i think it's worth defining some terms yeah great let's do that so when i'm talking about microbiome um i'm talking about the microscopic life forms um particularly in our gut. So I'm going to talk about the gut microbiome, but there are oral microbiomes, there's lung microbiomes, very relevant for COVID, um, but there are also kitchen microbiomes. That, so, but we're going to be talking about the gut microbiome um, unless I say otherwise. Um, I'm specifically going to be talking mostly about bacteria. So our, the gut bacteria, our, the gut bacteria in our gut, but there are also other microbes. So yeasts, fungi, viruses, um, and other microscopic life. Um, but it's bacteria that are best studied um, and that I can kind of work with in clinic most effectively. Um, and another very sort of technical thing, um, when we talk about microbiome, so in the medical literature, that actually means the genome of the microbes. So the genetic material um, and microbiota specifically refers to the, you know, the little microbes themselves. But because microbiome is the term that's most commonly used outside of the medical literature, I just, I'm going to stick with that one. Um, so there's that. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about the inflammatory capacity of the microbiome. So this is the function. Um, a lot of microbiome research really kind of dives into individual species. And I think in a way, that's a bit of a red herring. We need to think of it in terms of a system and its function. Um, and we've got certain species, certain kinds of bacteria in the gut that promote inflammation. And if they're out of balance, if they're um, overgrown, like the population is too high, um, they will be contributing to inflammation both locally in the gut. So that will be causing things like gut pain, 
um, feelings of being bloated and sometimes, you know, even the actual bloatedness is, is fluid, um, not just gas. Um, and then there are others that contribute an anti-inflammatory function. So they're producing things. So specifically, there's a, a group of bacteria that produce something called butyrate. Um, and that has many, many functions in the body, including feeding the lining of our gut, the cells lining of our gut, but it, it, it suppresses inflammation. It's a very powerful mast cell stabilizer. Um, so I think that's a piece that's often overlooked in the, in the mast cell conversations is the role of the microbiome itself in stabilizing mast cells. So that's the kind of the, the bit that I'm going to be referring to mostly is the kind of the reduction in anti-inflammatory activity of the microbiome and the excess of pro-inflammatory species. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, so, so, so given all of that, where do you normally start <laughs> when someone, I mean, so obviously you're probably going to need to do some tests to find out what's actually going on, but what are the most common things that people need to change or need to do? I mean, yes. So in my practice, obviously, I tailor all of my advice to someone's unique gut microbiome. So everyone's gut microbiome is like their fingerprint. It's completely unique, although we share common species, but proportions and things are different. So yes, I always start with a, a stool test, um, which is just a simple swab of used toilet paper. Um, but if someone's just going into this from a more kind of general, like how can I support that anti-inflammatory um, capacity of my microbiome? Um, that would be firstly, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a food first practitioner, so I'm going to be looking at, at someone's diet um, and the kind of diet that supports, seems to support the, the healthiest or the most health promoting balance of our microbiome is essentially the Mediterranean diet. Um, so it's quite First time I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like time and time again and you know there are so many other diets out there aren't there like you know the low carb diet and all of those things and, and actually that can be quite damaging to the microbiome because it's restricting certain nutrients that our beneficial bacteria need so um microbiome diet is minimally processed um lots and lots of plants lots of color um healthy oils um, proteins mainly from plants and fish rather than the kind of more meat um, sources and fermented foods so live foods like yogurt kefir sauerkraut so that's that's a kind of broad um, brushstroke and of course you know someone's got gut issues it's quite hard to kind of leap in with that so particularly things like fermented foods and histamine intolerance like you know, funny enough, I was pretty much always okay, but I started very small. So when you've got used to having food intolerances for, you know, 15, 20 years, <laughs> you, when you're trying something new, you start very small. So, um, and build up. So that's, that's one thing I'd always advise. So colors, um, colors and strong and bitter flavors and foods. So the bright colors, um, and things like cu colorful grains, so red rice, black rice, um, eating the rainbow every day. I mean, they, they, all, of, all of the colors are something called polyphenols, which feed our beneficial bacteria. Um, and they're particularly high in things like berries, which can be a histamine trigger for some people, but if they're not, then go for it with the berries. <laughs> Um, but if you are someone who's got a very restricted diet, then the diversity of your gut might be, you're, you're not feeding your beneficial bacteria with a diversity of plant foods. So um, maximizing diversity through, through using color can be really helpful. So if lettuce or carrots are, are a safe food for you, then, you know, red lettuce, you know, frilly lettuce, <laughs> iceberg lettuce, um, and carrots you know red carrots orange carrots yellow carrots purple beetroot carrots. i mean is beetroot well tolerated um it's it can be for, yeah i mean it can have a laxative effect for some people can't yeah. it um but yeah it's colorful yeah. um and getting that real that whole spectrum in your day the red orange yellow green 
blue, purple, black. <laughs> it's another character category and the kind of whites and browns. If you're getting a good spread, um, then you're, you're feeding a, a diversity of um, gut bacteria. But then a, a lot of things in the, me in the Mediterranean diet, like olive oil, not olives, they're very high in, um, and herbs, they're very high in polyphenols. So they're really great microbiome foods. Um, can you tell us what, you, what you've seen with long COVID patients in terms of how they're presented, um, in terms of symptoms, microbiome, and potentially treatments, and how similar that is to other people you have seen previous to the pandemic with other chronic fatigue conditions? Um, I mean, most of my experience with chronic fatigue was, has been in craniosacral. I ran a specialist right. clinic for a number of years um, before I got into the microbiome work. Um, so I'm not so sure I would say I have the kind of large enough sample right. count to say, to be able to draw those parallels. But the things that are really clear are, is that whole thing about the inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory capacity. Um, so people will come to me with one or both of those um, out of whack. So they may have quite a good anti-inflammatory population, but their pro-inflammatory bacteria are quite high um, or the other way around. So interestingly, a lot of the long COVID people who found their way to my practice have got longer term gut issues um, and constipation being a really big one. Um, which suggests that there has been some long-term imbalance in their, their inflammatory capacity of their microbiome because con constipation and inflammation, you know, really go hand in hand. Um, and so when that first started happening, I was thinking, is that just because these people have like a long-term interest in, you know, the gut microbiome and so they, they found me. So I did a, a poll in one of the big Facebook groups for the long COVID support groups. And it was really interesting because there's about two thirds of people had constipation in their in their longer term history. Um, a small percentage had absolutely perfect gut yeah. health. Um, and I think what's kind of interesting in terms of the medical literature that's coming out about COVID itself and how it affects the gut microbiome is it seems to push the gut microbiome towards an inflammatory um, profile. Um, and you know I could go into a lot of detail about that but I think that's <laughs> beyond what people need here um, but particularly suppressing the anti-inflammatory bacteria and, and and I think that's what's made COVID so dangerous to people who already have an inflammatory profile so that's the people with kind of uh, diabetic um, cardiovascular disease and those sort of high risk groups um, getting into that hyperinflammation. So, and there are, there's very little discussion so far in medical literature about long COVID, but where it has been, it's sort of been at the end of the paper talking about microbiome changes in acute COVID and suggesting that though having noticed that those changes that they observe within the microbiome of people with COVID persist long, long after the kind of respiratory illness has, has um, and that the, the kind of more acute symptoms have resolved. So suggesting that the microbiome, that, that inflammatory profile um, it can be really central to look, those, that persistence of long COVID symptoms. And that is what I'm finding. So when people come to me um, in my practice, I mean, I always check that inflammatory profile anyway, whoever it is, but with long COVID, I'm particularly seeing that. Um, I'm particularly seeing a depletion in a group of bacteria called bifidobacterium which are, I sort of think of them as the kind of soothing bacteria in the gut. So they have a very strong relationship with what we call the microbiome gut brain axis. So that communication pathway between yeah. the, the, the stress response in particular and the gut. Um, so that's always a focus is to feed up those bifidobacterium um, again with polyphenols, but also prebiotics. Um, so um, prebiotics are the foods of the beneficial bacteria, whereas probiotics, which people talk about more commonly, are the um, little capsules or powders of, of bacteria that you actually take. Um, so my, 
my focus is much more about feeding up the bacteria that we've actually got already in our gut um, and using probiotics specifically where there's clinical trials showing that it has a positive effect. They, they do good on the way through. They don't repopulate the gut. Um, hence, prebiotics are needed for that more lasting change. So let's say that you've got a long hauler who is not histamine sensitive. Uh, so two part mm -hmm. question. So yep. if you've got a long hauler who's, who's um, yeah, not histamine sensitive, what can they potentially do in terms of making alterations to their diets um, that might help give some of these prebiotics to the bacteria that are likely to be needing some help? Um, and for then for people who are histamine sensitive, is it difference in terms of what your suggestions might be? Great question. Um, so people who don't have a uh, histamine tolerance are uh, intolerance. I would say make use of probiotics, um, and, um, in particular, there's, there's one called, um, lactocaceae bacillus rhamnosus GG. Um, and the GG is really important. The rhamnosus GG is the really important bit because GG is talking about the strain. So not the species, but the strain. So there's, there's different strains like GR1. That's really great for the vaginal microbiome, but we're talking about GG because it, um, we know from clinical trials as it alters the, the cytokine profile with us or the inflammatory markers um, within the body. Um, interestingly, it also degrades histamine and it stabilizes mast cells. So I will try that with my histamine clients. Um, it's actually pretty well tolerated, just not by everyone. Um, so that's that's probably one that that I would say there's there's a whole suite of other probiotics that I use in my practice, but obviously it's really tailored to people's individual symptoms. But that would be general advice. But then it's the the prebiotics. Um, now I tend to use prebiotic supplements in my practice just because you can get a really measurable dose and you can start small and, and build up. Whereas if you get it naturally from within foods, which is obviously the kind of ultimate goal, um, you can't always, there, there are different amounts and, you know, but so from prebiotic supplements, there's ones that I use, that how they have names like PHGG or sun fiber, GOS, um, FOS, inulin, so I would use a different range of those depending on which parts of the microbiome are out of balance. Um, but one that's um, probably quite good for the, the bifido bifidobacteria is GOS. Um, and the kind of more widely available brand for that is Bimuno. I don't use that in my practice because it's full of sugars and, and stuff like that. But that's one that's available. Um, and then, yes, the, the bright colors and the strong flavors, obviously. Um, but getting it from those, those particular, some of those things can't be got from food, like PHGG comes from the guava bean. Um, and it's, it's partially hydrated. Anyway, it's partially hydrolyzed. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's something that's only available in supplement form. But things like GOS, inulin, um, resistant starches, they're found in different food groups. So there's the onion family and the sunflower family. So Jerusalem artichokes, um, that's the inulin foss, that's asparagus, leeks, onions, those sorts of things. Then there's goss, which is in um, pulses, seeds, beets, um, the brassicas. So that's cabbage, beet, um, cabbage and broccoli and, and things like that. Pulses are a really great source. Um, so for histamine intolerant people, some pulses can be really problematic, particularly chickpeas, kidney beans. But actually it's worth finding some that you can tolerate. Um, so broad, and, yeah, broad beans are actually quite well tolerated, um, butter beans, um, and trying to introduce as many of those, that variety into your diet. Um, the other, other sort of quite neglected um, prebiotics are resistant starches. Um, and they are found in starchy vegetables, starchy grains. Um, and they're particularly found in higher concentrations in things like potatoes that have been cooked and then cooled, or rice that's been cooked and then cooled. Um, Again, if you're really histamine sensitive, if your histamine bucket's really full, then some of those cooled foods, you know, aren't, aren't so easy for you. 
Um, but it also found in green bananas, so unripe bananas or unripe plantain, um, pistachio nuts. Um, so yeah, so those sorts of things, um, making sure you're including ideally at least one from each food of those groups in your, in your day. Um, and what about lentils? Because lentils are qu like query histamine, aren't they? Um, what's your experience in terms of tolerance across the board with lentils? It's interesting. I don't think I tolerated them that badly at all, actually. Mm. Um, but then it was so hard, so hard to know, isn't it? When you've got yeah. ongoing gut issues. Um, so, I mean, I'm all, I just very much say, talk about trying these things out but the thing is with with histamine intolerance and i think particularly for long covid where there hasn't been a, a longer term histamine issues it's most likely going to be about inflammation in the gut and that um the change in the microbiome that's destabilized the mast cells so for me like the restrictive side of the the low histamine diet is short term and what we're actually working on is building up that anti-inflammatory capacity of the gut building up that capacity of the microbiome to produce butyrate to stabilize the mast cells allow that inflammation to kind of settle back uh, and allow the, you know the histamine degrading enzymes actually reach the the food in our gut and, and things like that so for me it's always about looking for a path out of histamine intolerance and particularly using by the time you've got that level of destabilization in the gut and that level of inflammation, you are looking at using prebiotic supplements, I think. I mean, I'd love to say that people can do it just through diet. Um, but, and it's quite hard to, you have to start small with prebiotics, um, particularly the stronger ones like inulin. Um, because when you're, feeding up your beneficial bacteria, especially at first, they're producing lots of gas because they're very excited, <laughs> finally getting food. Um, and so that gas, that, that wind that in, in your tummy can be quite painful. Um, not usually smelly, but, <laughs> um, but painful. Um, so that, that can make it very difficult to kind of build up, uh, particularly using prebiotics in your diet. Because if you're someone who you know, farts a lot with broad, with um, baked beans, you know, you're going to, and you, you get a lot of pain, <laughs> you're not going to eat baked beans again. Um, so, but the approach would be to eat, you know, two or three baked beans one day, six or seven the next, you know, three, yeah. two teaspoons, you know, so it's like, yeah. it, but but need, having that confidence that you're doing the right thing, um, even though it's causing you some symptoms, um, I think that can be quite challenging. Yeah, and I think one of the big questions that's come back is like, well, how long do we need to be on this low histamine diet for? And look, I haven't been able to say much more than until we're better, <laughs> you know, but I haven't really had an idea about what the route out of it is, if you know what I mean. So that's, I think, quite a tricky challenge for a lot of people. Yeah, and um, you see, I would say, I think it'd be very hard to get out of histamine tolerance issues without addressing the microbiome mm. because the healthy microbiome is needed like the mast cells are lining the gut aren't they um and the microbiome is talking directly to those mast cells via the chemicals that it, it it produces but also mast cells elsewhere in the body via the chemicals that it produces usually kind of the waste products after it's digested our food um, so that's beneficial waste products, ideally, but also perhaps the inflammatory markers that especially if you've got localized inflammation in the gut, you've got systemic infl inflammatory um, chemicals circulating in the body. So that's also triggering. It's not just histamine. Mast cells produce lots and lots of other um, compounds that contribute to things like brain fog and fatigue. And um, yeah, so that whole inflammatory profile. Um, so yeah, so that comes back to like the main thing here is the role of the microbiome in inflammation, but also how responsive it is to treatment. Um, so I think that's actually a really positive thing. It's like that there, there is stuff that you can do. It's very cutting edge. And I mean, it shouldn't be by now, but it still is very cutting edge in terms of, um, our medical understanding of the microbiome. Um, 
Yeah. So is, is there anything, we just spoken about what you should do. Is there anything that are just big, like general no's? So don't do this. Because some people may already be doing things that may be having very negative effects without realizing it. So is there anything out there that you would often generally tend to say, don't do this, don't do that? I mean, probably a lot of people who found their way to this this YouTube channel aren't going to be doing the kind of yeah. junk food diet and the yeah. beige and the high high fat actually quite actually that is one that comes up a lot isn't it low carb high fat mm. um that that's that's quite a, a uh you know a trendy diet isn't it um, yeah and, and the, another one might be low FODMAP um so that's usually it's about one of the only things that a gp will recommend for someone who's got ibs <laughs> yeah, that's another little <laughs> high horse i get on um you know um because if you remove the fodmaps you tend to help manage symptoms but the fodmaps most of them are actually foods for our beneficial bacteria so the reason they cause symptoms is because our beneficial bacteria are producing gas um so what happens is they start they reduce FODMAPs but then what they find is that when they they reduce it it's like they can't actually reintroduce things and people end up on the low FODMAP diet for many years sometimes starving their beneficial bacteria making the whole thing a lot worse um so so that's that's a tricky one and I would say always work with a practitioner if you're doing low FODMAP with a reintroduction pathway um because that's it is good for short-term symptom management, but if you're not addressing the imbalance, um, it's a bit like histamine, you know, low histamine diet, good in the short term. If you're not addressing the fundamental imbalance in the microbiome, then you're boxing yourself in for a restricted diet long-term. And I did that, you know, I did various restricted diets, but, you know, pretty much the low histamine diet for, you know, 25 years fundamentally. And it's like, had to work really hard to get that diversity back up in my microbiome and, and that, that the beneficial species so so there's that and then the high fat one that can be quite problematic there's a particular group of bacteria that eat the bile in our gut and there's one it's called um it's got a lovely name so i'll, I'll say it anyway it's bilophila wadsworthia um and it particularly likes the bile that um, is produced when we eat dairy fat, but also coconut fat. So I often find um, people who've had a bit of a health journey are often, you know, eating, you know, spoonfuls of coconut oil um, or using coconut oil in their cooking because that's, you know, there's so many studies that show it's only beneficial in lots of ways. But actually, if they've got an imbalance, if they've got an overgrowth of bilophila, which they will be feeding with that, um, bilophila actually produces something called hydrogen sulfide gas. So it's that really horrible eggy smell. Mm. Um, but it's a nerve gas, so it causes visceral hypersensitivity. So what we find is that people start then cutting out the things that give them wind, things like baked beans that really feed your beneficial bacteria. Um, and there's, you know, upping their... their um, their coconut oil but so they're causing that um imbalance even further and then if they're cutting out the, the FODMAPs then bilophila starts to really enjoy the environment because beneficial bacteria tend to keep those harmful bacteria at low levels so so those are probably yeah the kind of the advice that I would give people who've been on that health journey um like I say I don't think there's going to be many junk food people essentially maybe there are when people want to Google this and find out, do we spell GOS like Luke GOS and Matt GOS? Is it G-O-S-S? No, G-O-S. Okay, so it fine. stands for galacto oligosaccharide. So sugars that we can't absorb. Yeah. So they go right the way through our digestion to our large intestine, which is where our microbiome lives, and that's that's where they feed on it. Yeah. Um, and so is there anything relevant to dealing with brain fog as a symptom? Or are we also still here talking about the nature of this inflammatory pathways that are potentially leading to brain fog? You know, I think it's probably all roads lead to Rome here, really, when it comes to inflammation, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, brain fog. I mean, interestingly, that is one of the things I see respond quickest to microbiome mm. work. Um, so within two weeks, less than a month people are going wow my brain fog is so much better is, is leaky gut commonly seen amongst the long covid population 
Because it's commonly uh, perceived and commonly attributed to it. Is it, are you seeing it frequently? I mean, I guess I infer leaky gut from looking at the inflammatory profile mm. of the gut bacteria. So yes, I see people with reduced anti-inflammatory bacteria or overgrowths of pro-inflammatory bacteria. So yeah, I pretty much conclude leaky gut in that way i mean i don't diagnose as part of my practice i'm i'm looking at the solutions um so i'm addressing the the in you know the the imbalance in the inflammatory profile and um that's what that's what gets the results in terms of improvement of symptoms and if people want to learn a little bit more about microbiome and its effect on health where would you point them where are good resources to go and actually just start to educate themselves a little bit more? I spent all my time in medical literature. Yeah. So there are some fantastic books out there, uh, reportedly. I just haven't read them because, to be honest, by the time a book is published, it's really it's off out the pace. of date. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I'd say medical literature, but you do need to understand the jargon, don't you? It's like yeah. eating raw pasta, reading some of those papers. There's one practitioner who I really rate, a guy called Jason Horolak, okay. um, who's a really progressive naturopath in Australia. Um, and he very much, he's kind of a real pioneer in terms of the, the, the pre, prebiotics, pre and probiotics. Um, so any podcasts that have him in. Right. <laughs> um, that's, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. He's not why he, he's talking a lot to practitioners. So he's not like massively accepts like some people I have recommended him to people are going, Oh gosh, don't understand him. But other people find him really fantastic. Mm. So if you've kind of got a little bit of knowledge to, to yeah. springboard from then, then he's a good person to follow. Um, yeah. My Instagram profile is full of useful information. It is actually. I mean, okay. I do really. So, work how do people find? How do people find your Instagram profile? Um, it's Viola Sampson, all one word underscore right. microbiome underscore cranio. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll put a link in the um, in the description on the film yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> and finally, and perhaps most importantly, how did you get back to eating pizza? I am dying for a pepperoni pizza, and I've not been able to go near one for over a year. Oh, man, you have my yeah. sympathy. You really do. Um, how did I do it? Gosh, I mean, it's kind of hard because I would say it was my whole therapeutic journey right from the ME right the way through. So a lot of vagus nerve stimulation. So craniosacral therapy, obviously, meditation, qigong, mm. psychotherapy, EMDR. So unpicking. So that's one thing we do find. As, and this is the... I think this is the really cruel side of fatigue conditions is it gets super active people and people who have some kind of trauma history, um, whether that's big T trauma or low level kind of, you know, continuous trauma. So that it's often the people who've got that nervous system running anyway. And this is, you know, this is very much true for me, you know, childhood history, trauma, super active partying all night studying all day um and, and and physically very active as well so for me so that the the kind of trauma therapies and the managing my own nervous system um and pacing I would say it's very very hard almost I would probably go as far as saying it's impossible to get out of a fatigue condition without learning pacing to an absolute art form like spotting and that requires a lot of body awareness which is not easy when you're in pain you feel like shit the last thing you want is body awareness but really are noticing where you're reaching your limits because they come really quickly don't they it's either you know getting too cold or too hot or you know exhausted doing the washing up but you just need to do that last fork and no boom you're you know you've run over your limit um so it's so very acute pacing skills um, and then from, and all of that is relevant to the gut microbiome absolutely because the role of the stress response and the vagus nerve in um, influencing the composition of our microbiome is, is really key um, so there's that whole piece which is kind of nervous the nervous system piece you know that routine yeah. 
Um, and then the, yeah, so restricted diets were probably important for a bit of that time, but I did it for so long because I didn't have that pathway out. Um, so then it was fermented foods and probiotics because that's all that was kind of talked about back in back in the olden days um and prebiotics that's yeah. really what 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 shifted it for me yeah, yeah. the long term yeah i mean great to hear that and um, from your story of actually working and recovering from chronic fatigue or me that lasted so long because a lot of people who have it for that long it's a very difficult how do you get that nervous system out of that pattern when it's been in that pattern for so long and it's so hard and i think um, you're Sorry. And, and I, I really want to acknowledge that I am one of the lucky ones. I mean, yeah. yes, it was a slog and hard work. Yeah. And I was incredibly fortunate to work with some amazing practitioners, um, you know, and, it, and, you know, practitioners who would, who would give me low fees as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't able to work for a big yeah. chunk of that time. So, so there is, but, you know, even for some people, even with all that hard work and yeah. all that commitment to their process, they're still not recovering. So I, I really want to acknowledge that, yeah. you know, a day does not go by and I've been recovering for 15 years now. A day does not go by where I'm not wildly grateful for the level of health that I've got now. Um, and I, I am, yeah, that it, that a lot of that is just luckiness as well as somehow finding the right keys to unlock that safe in a way um in the right order or whatever that, that got me out of it and, and i think everybody's safe is going to be different right to unlock that safe it's going to have yeah. a different code on it and it's going to need a different set of moves to unlock it and we don't really know what those are going to be it's such a yeah and, and as you say like that's it i mean you can even and even if you do find the right code for you are you going to be lucky enough that it's going to work, you know, and for some, not everybody necessarily has a path out. So it is. Yeah. And, and this is where I think a lot of the controversy still remains around the, around the idea of recovery from ME CFS long COVID is because there's no, there's no, there's no one way out. You know, it's not like, <laughs> it's like just do A, B, C, D, E, F, G and that's it. Right. It's like everybody oh, yeah. has their own alphabet and, and even then that might not work. So, yeah. And I think that's what can get really kind of poisonous around all of this it becomes yeah. blaming the patient for not doing X, Y, Z. And I yeah. think, you know, the amount of, I guess this is the piece that I'm really on at the moment is the kind of internalized ableism, both mm -hmm. within practitioners, because that's it. All honesty, that is rife within the complementary therapy world. <laughs> I wish it wasn't, but also within ourselves. And you know, especially if you've been a hugely active, healthy person to suddenly get over the, well, resting's, you know, that's laziness or I'm weak or, you know, it's like that, that, that is tough. And why aren't I getting better when it worked for this person? Or, you know, why are these people getting spontaneous? Like, you know, especially with ME, like some people do like, you know, a three day course in a particular kind of meditation or thinking their way out of it and suddenly they're better. And that works for some people. The no amount of thinking about it could get me well. You know, I needed to do so many other things. So yeah, that's a bit, it's a bit of a tangent, but it is something I'm really passionate about. In terms it, of... it, it's a tangent, but it's super important to everybody watching this. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's really central yeah, yeah. to chronic illness generally. It's just yeah. that acceptance. And, and I think the advantage that the long COVID community has that I didn't have when I had yuppie flu is not only like, so early diagnosis, knowing that rest is absolutely vital. I pushed through for years. So I ran on adrenaline for years and, you know, no, knowing about pacing very early on, that's setting up in really good stead. Um, and then of course, all the other insights around the role of inflammation and diet and vagus nerve stimulation, whether that's meditation or humming or all those sorts of things. You've got all of those to draw on. Next up in the series of expert interviews, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to a panel of experts on the subject of activity management, pacing, and the thorny, thorny subject of graded exercise therapy. Till next time.